So continuing with this part, uh, memory interface. So we can interface the memory in uh, two ways now. One is uh, having actual interface. That is, this is the memory what I want to interface. This is the memory. This is the memory what I want to interface with this, uh, say, uh, DSP uh, processor. Now, how do I go ahead with the interfacing? So in this case, so what, I, what happens is I can have one specific uh, element in between which looks after the interfacing aspects between these two. So it is like an intermediate person who is trying to establish communication between these two. Now uh, here, if you just see, uh, we have total Z A02, A22. So it is 23 address bits. So 23 address bits are there. So, and depending on how many uh, bits will be required to access the memory, because memory, whether it requires just 10 address bits out of this, whether it requires say 20 address bits out of this, so that has to be decided. So if I have to do that, then what is the, uh, say a logic I'll be implementing. So those address bits will be utilized to access the memory and also to enable a few of the signal like chip select I want to do. So if some bits are uh, left out, so those bits will be utilized for say, say for chip select. So these kind of uh, things are happening. So these are also present even in your microcontroller or microprocessor, whatever you have studied. Now uh, here we have uh, data, this thing, uh, data bus, which is of 16 bits. So data is of 16 bits. So here also is accessing that it is 16 bits of data will be accessed. So this is done with the help of the memory interface. Now uh, you have a few other things that is uh, this PSDS that is program state select and uh, data state select then memory stroke and whether you're performing a read write. So these all control signals also should be utilized. So these control signals will be given to memory interface and this memory interface will be converting them into appropriate form. So they will be converting it into write enable, uh, then uh, uh, and, uh, is, I guess it is output enable. It is output enable. So these are the things uh, what it gets converted to. Now, if I want to access this chip, this chip has to be enabled. If this chip enable is not working, then I'll not be able to uh, say send or receive any data or do any other operation. I cannot perform that. So that is uh, what uh, you have to recollect from the microcontroller point of view. So here, uh, what is the problem in uh, this kind of structure? So if I just look at the structure, what is happening is instead of this person directly communicating uh, with the memory, so him uh, communicating with the memory directly, so what he is doing, he is asking some other person to communicate. That is uh, in between some intermediate person is present. So what is happening? This uh, information is taking time to reach from processor to the memory. So I want to reduce this. I don't want this person so that I can improve the uh, speed with which the DSP can operate. Uh, now it is like uh, if uh, I have to cooperate with this one, right, memory. If this memory is again still slower, what happens is this person has to wait until the operation is over. So that is he has sent a data request and he wants to read data from particular memory. So that information has been reached to the memory. So now you are accessing it, but this memory is slow enough that it is slow. So what happens is it will take a lot of time. So by the time it is reading data, this person has to wait. He has to wait. So therefore you have something called as wait states, which are included in DSP again, because DSP looks for fast processing, but at times it has to deal with members who are slower than him. So in that cases, wait states have to be included. So this is uh, what is happening. So in this one, uh, you have a memory interface in between and you are, access, you are uh, providing the interface between the processor and the memory via this memory interface. So this person is looking after the interfacing aspects. But if I don't want this in order to uh, improve the speed, then I have another structure for this, wherein you don't include this memory interface. So that is, I think, uh, so this is the example. That is, you don't, you have no external uh, decode uh, present over there. So in between, I don't have any third party present over here. That is no encoding or decoding has, has to be done. Whereas in this case, what happens is he, uh, this interface receives the message from uh, the uh, processor. He has to take that, encode it or decode it and send it to the memory. And then again, has to receive the uh, information from the memory and send it back to the processor. So the, the, it is like no encoding, decoding or no decoding is present at all in the other case, that is this case. So here directly you are communicating, directly you are communicating. 
and this is again uh, external memory interface that is what is happening over here and here you can see that he is uh, taking only 13 bits of the address so sram is of uh, 13 bits address so if it is 13 bit uh, what is the memory size you can just estimate say 2 raised to 13 depending on how many words are there if it is 8 bits it is 2 raised to 13 uh, say uh, 2 raised to 13 bytes of uh, information is present is available over here address space uh, then we have uh, 16 bits of uh, data which is directly provided uh, then uh, how do you specify how do you access this uh, sram or the external memory you use the you enable the chip select if you don't enable this then i cannot access this sram entirely i cannot access this so that is done with what master stroke signal which is present in the processor then whether i am reading or writing so that is controlled by this signal this signal is given to write enable so write enable so write enable if this is one it is actually reading if this is zero it is writing that is this person wants to write information to this ram if this is one he is just reading the information back based on the address what is present and then you have the output enable which is grounded so if it is grounded it implies that always output is enabled because it is active low open so this is what is happening over here and whether it is in the microprocessor mode or microcomputer mode so that is being selected since vcc is specified it is in microprocessor mode so similar to your microprocessor how it is operating so this is uh, totally eliminating the inter intermediate person wherein you are increasing the speed with which you are accessing the data and retrieving the data compared compared to the other one so that is uh, what you have uh, done over here now uh, here you can see that uh, it is 5416 so in 5416, how many address bits are actually present? So in 5416, you have totally of 20 address bits. Actually, you can have or different this thing, you can have from 16 to 23 bits of address. So different, different device can have in this range. So this is having 20 address bits. So since this is having 20 address bits, if you just look at uh, this point, 13, so remaining, uh, how many are there? Remaining seven bits are unused. So those seven bits can be utilized for some logical implementation. Like uh, if I want to enable the chip select, I can make use of those also. I can have that combination. So in later this thing, we can just observe uh, these things. So here uh, he has given an example that uh, for this figure, that is this entire information, For this uh, this representation, for this representation, uh, assume that the SRAM in figure uh, 9.5, it is to used to hold a program. How many address ranges exist in this processor? That is 5416 processor to access this memory. So here, in order to access this entire memory, how many address ranges are actually possible over here? That is what he is trying to specify. Now here you can see that you are using 13 bits. You are using 13 bits. So you can, uh, the address will be what? Uh, address will be. Here you can uh, see if it is 13 bits, right? It can be all zeros up to all ones. So if that is the case, so then uh, four, four bits, then uh, so in, One second, I have a call. So the address will be what? Uh, here, 12 bits uh, free, uh, this thing will be uh, 12 bits. It will be FF and the last one bit, if it is set to uh, zero, so this will be zero FF. And uh, the last address will be one, sorry, uh, this is, uh, sorry, uh, this is all zeros. This is all zeros. This will be one FF. So this is the address, so this, this will be the address range in that memory. That is for this purpose. 13 bits are there. So the addresses will be ranging from this point to this point. That is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1 FF FF. Now, uh, what is the other thing is, uh, uh, what, what about the other seven, seven bits? So if I uh, take those uh, bits, so in uh, this case, right, uh, the address is assumed to be uh, 23 bits. That is what he is specifying. 
for this one he has taken the address uh, this thing to be around uh, uh, say not 7 bits extra he is taking uh, around uh, say 13 uh, 10 bits extra he is taking 10 bits extra that is he is uh, considering that uh, this processor is having uh, 23 bits of address bits this processor is having 23 bits of address bits so that is what he is specifying so if that is the case then how many bits are remaining nine uh, say uh, uh, 20, uh, 10 bits are uh, remaining over there. So if 10 bits are remaining, what is the possible combination for those 10 bits? It is all zeros or all 10 bits equal to one. So if this is the case, then what happens is, what happens is along with this address, along with this address, uh, this is fixed. This is fixed. This is fixed. But what about the values of remaining A13 to A22, what is specifying? A13 to A22, what is specifying? So it can be anything. So remaining address is like don't care. Remaining 10 bits is like don't care. So it can be either 0, either 1 or any combination. So it is, that is the case. So what happens is this combination turns out to be 2 raised to 10. That is, you can have 1024 combinations for this. This is fixed. This is fixed. Only possible change you can have is over here. Over here. Because this uh, memory, right, this is uh, having only 13 bits of address. It is not having more than that. It is not having more than that. But your uh, processor is having more than those bits. Your processor address bits are. 23 what is specifying over here. So if that is the case, 10 bits are access. So those 10 bits can be in don't care condition. So if they are in don't care condition, what happens? You have total of 2 raised to 10 or 1024 valid addresses. So if I want to access, for example, if uh, this entire memory is there, if I want to access the first location, uh, then total of uh, 20 bits, so all can be 0. Total of 20 bits, the first address if I want to access, then how it will be? It will be uh, total five zeros. That is four bits each. So total, uh, sorry, uh, 20 and another two. So it will be all zeros over here. It will be all zeros over here. If I want to access this address again, uh, that is in a different form. If I not again, in different form. So what I can uh, do is I can access this by specifying these uh, any of this bit as one say if i am specifying the last bit 20 second bit that is all zeros and the last bit as one so this will give you the next this thing range for this address so again if i continue it will give you so next possible this thing of the address so it is like all these addresses can be associated with uh, these bits or it can be associated with this combination or it can be associated with all being one all being one. So the, it, it can have possible of 1000, uh, 1024 combinations. It can have total of 1024 combinations. So that is uh, what he specifies over here. So this is how we can access the addresses in different forms. So there, therefore, there are total 1024 address ranges which exist for this example what he has specified. In a continuation uh, with the same uh, stuff. So here he has given an example related to the flash memory. And here you can see that previously there was direct access, what he was doing with the chip select, write enable, output enable. But here uh, what he is doing is he is uh, using these signals, these master stroke, read, write, and external flag. These signals in order to enable the write and the output. So based on this combination, you are either doing reading or writing. And the DS is still used for chip enable, chip enable or chip select. So that is what he is performing. Okay. So for flash, he is not directly uh, giving these signals. He is using this uh, logical implementation in order to achieve uh, this combination. So that is what he is trying to do over here. So again, uh, how many bits are uh, there? Again, it depends on what is the memory size of this? What is the memory size of this? So in this case, he has taken a memory of 64K 16 flash memory. 
So what does 64K imply? So I'll come down to this part. Uh, so here uh, we can uh, see that uh, if based on the memory capacity, you can uh, choose the how many address lines are required. So if I have 1K memory, what does it mean? In your binary, 1K implies 2 raised to 10. K implies 2 raised to 10. So here uh, 1K implies it is 1 into 2 raised to 10 memory locations or memory capacity. So memory capacities and uh, uh, and how many address bits will be required since 2 to the power of 10, that is uh, for 2 is raised to the power of 10, that implies that 10 address lines are required over here. So similarly, if I come to this one, 2 into 2 to the power of 10, so it is 2 raised to 11. So 11 address lines are required over here. So similarly, if I continue 64K, so 64 is 2 raised to 6 into 2 raised to 10. So it is 2 raised to 10 plus 6. So total 16 address lines are required. 16 address lines and these are the memory locations which are available. Now, what is the size of each memory location? It depends on the word size what he has specified. So here he has specified it as 16. So in uh, this case, it is 16 uh, bits will form one word. One memory location will be 16 bits in size. That is what he specified. So based on this, you have to choose the address line. So here you can see that address line is A0 to 15, which is 16. Why it is 16? Because memory is 64K. So this is why we have to look out for these all things. So here, uh, there is again slightly a different uh, version of uh, the other uh, this thing. What is what he is specifying? He is specifying that he has this address range and using this uh, for this processor, uh, use 2K by 8 SRAM memory chips. So you have to design this entire memory system. You have to design this entire memory system. So here, uh, these are the address ranges. So based on these address ranges, you have to identify how many 2K uh, by 8 SRAM memories are required. So you have to find the difference and uh, divide it into uh, this form such that uh, you get the how many number of 2K um, memory chips are required. So in this case, you require two memory chips. In this case, you require two memory chips. That is the system address uh, range is specified over there. Now, what I want to do is I want to uh, access any one of this. So in order to do that, what I uh, do is, or uh, if I have to access the data, right, then this is how I access it. So that is eight bits over here. Eight implies that there are eight bits, uh, eight bits in this SRAM. One SRAM will give you eight bits and next eight bits are available in the other SRAM. So that is uh, what they are specifying. So D, uh, that is data D0 uh, to D7 bits are present over here and the remaining bits are present in the other SRAM. Then how many address lines are required? So if you just see it is 2K, 2 raised to 1 into 2 raised to 10. So it will be 2 raised to 11. So 11 address bits, 11 address bits are required. That is A0 to A10. So this will, uh, this will be equal to, uh, it will be equal to uh, 11 address bits. So this will be used to access the memory. This will be used to access the memory. And again, you can see that here uh, based on the combination, based on these combinations, DS, read, write, and memory stroke, memory stroke, read enable, write enable, uh, write enable, and output enable. So these all things will be done. Okay. So this is what is happening in these cases. Now here you can see that uh, chip select, uh, he has uh, specified some extra connection over here. So if I come down, what they're doing is, they're using the remaining, sorry. <clears throat> they're using the remaining uh, address bits to uh, decode which one I'll be selecting. So which one I'll be selecting. So you can use this decode logic. So with the remaining address bits. So if I'm using 11, so how many are remaining uh, around uh, 12 are remaining. Uh, so 22, 11, 12 are uh, remaining over there. So 12, if all 12 are remaining, I can use those 12 bits as a decode logic. So in a microprocessor, you used to microcontroller, microprocessor, you used to do this. So this is how the memory system is organized for the given address space. So this is how it goes around. Okay. So this one I'll not again go in depth because again it is related to related to the same this thing what we discussed. So here I specifically mentioned that these address bits are 
decoded based on this NAND logic. So then only this will be enabled, otherwise it will not be enabled. So based on this, again, you can have different, different combinations possible. And a call to Okay. So coming to uh, next this thing, that is the parallel IO interface. Uh, so now uh, here we'll be discussing regarding uh, the IO interfacing. So IO is the input output uh, devices, what we want to interface. So previously we discussed regarding a memory interface. Now we come to interfacing such as uh, A to D converters or D to A converters. If I require uh, uh, these things, I can uh, connect these devices as uh, IO devices. So if I have to connect this, then how do I go ahead with the communicating with them? So in general, we know that we have something called as port uh, read and port write instructions, which are available. <clears throat> so here uh, using those again, uh, we can access uh, these stuff. And again, along with that, we require some other uh, interfacing aspects, which are signals, which are required. So here one example uh, he has specified wherein he is performing a read, write, and read sequence. And he is performing it related to the IO, this thing device, which is present over there. So again, entire thing remains same. So just one parameter which comes in is this IS bar. That is, it is IO state space. So it tells, uh, if it is low, it tells that I am accessing IO device. Otherwise, it'll, if it is high, it is telling that I am not accessing any IO device. Whether I am accessing any other thing is given by the other uh, the signal that is DS bar, that is data space, uh, 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 data space select or uh, the PS that is program state select. So that is uh, what it is specifying. So if I'm accessing IO right, this signal has to be active low. So if it is low, then I'll be able to access it, access the IO device. And at the same time, when I'm performing uh, IO read write right, right based on that, uh, based on the operation required, IO strobe will be activated so this is again active low so if you are performing some say io read it has to be active um, active low if you are performing the io write again it has to be active low so that is uh, if i just consider so th there is a rising edge so during this time period from one this thing to uh, next time period so within this the uh, write cycle starts off so and the write uh, write operation will be performed so since you are doing write over here if I if you just observe, we are performing right over here. So read write signal. If you just observe, it is active low, and when you are performing read operation, it is active high. It is active high. So this is how it goes around, and the address uh, that is what data you are accessing. That address also has to be known. So that address will be taken, and then it will be uh, given to the uh, intended uh, device, and will be accessing the data over there, either reading it or writing it. So this is how it goes around for IO interfaces. Uh, then uh, actually we have uh, three kinds of IO, uh, this thing that is uh, we have uh, unconditional IO, programmed IO and interrupt IO. The simplest being the uh, unconditional IO. So in this one, what happens is there is no handshake signals present. Now, for example, if I uh, have to communicate with you. So before starting of the communication, I should uh, inform you that, okay, uh, there is a class at three o'clock or four o'clock, please join in. So that is the handshake signal and you'll be responding, okay. So that is the handshake signal, which is present, but without any handshake signal also, I can uh, go ahead and uh, we can perform some tasks. That is directly you uh, tell and you'll, you'll, you'll be uh, coming forth. There is no acknowledgement, no other steps. So in your in communication, if you look, uh, say in your TCP, so uncontrolled, uh, so un unconditional IO will not be having any handshake signals to be exchanged prior to communication. So there will be no polling or nothing. Directly, if you want to write, you can go and write the data. For example, if memory uh, is associated with this IO device, and then uh, if I want to read directly, I'll be reading. it. So that is how I go ahead. So next I have programmed IO and uh, interrupt IO. So in uh, programmed IO, what happens is uh, the CPU keeps on polling. Uh, the devices which are connected to see whether there is any data associated with them so, they, so that they want to send it or receive some data that is whether they are ready so if they are ready then uh, 
we program the this thing I can tell that okay we can if you want to transmit you can transmit but if you are ready to receive then i have some data i'll be sending in so something of uh, these kind uh, will be happening in programmed io so in this one what is happening is cpu continue, cpu is continuously polling so it is keeping track of uh, the devices which actually want to communicate or whether they are ready to receive the data so these all things are happening over here now uh, in association with this you can have uh, you can use some uh, registers over here which are termed as gpio that is general purpose io control registers and the general purpose io uh, say status control registers so what is this uh, uh, gpio cr doing over here so it is actually looking after the signals which are required for io interfacing gpio control register it is looking after the signals which are associated for io interfacing and what does status register doing status register is keeping track of what is happening which signals are changed what is happening so it is like a kind of a flag which is associated over there so it is keeping track of those stuffs so that is what they are doing using these two registers and uh, then uh, here we can uh, see uh, with the respect to in general uh, tms uh, 320c 54xx you have a a to d converter which is connected now uh, uh, here what we are doing is so since this is a a to d converter you give you every, any analog signal which is coming in uh, it has to be converted into digital form and given to the and given to the uh, processor over here since this has to deal with only uh, digital aspects so th these devices will be required now if analog signal is there that has to be converted to digital form and then it has to be given to the processor so in this case what happens is edc wants to give data to the processor so when uh, say this uh, is uh, polling the device right edc will tell that i have data and i want to send whether i can send it or not so how that communication is done that communication is done with the help of these two that is external flag and uh, branch control output bio bar is branch control output so what these do is uh, in short if i have to tell so here address decoder everything will be there then every uh, read bar will be enabled so all this will be there but the major role is actually related with this so what happens is initially initially this person uh, or the processor it will poll it will send a logic one to this adc converter so when it sends a logic one to this adc converter what happens it gives an information that is this processor gives an information to the adc telling that i am ready to receive data if there is any so in if there is any then what it does is it sends gives an intimation and then it makes this one again zero so it has given an intimation that i was ready so if anything is there you can send in and again it makes it as zero so within this time period what it does is it waits for some amount of time so it makes one it waits for some amount of time and it makes that data again zero so in uh, this process uh, if branch control output is made zero that is the signal is received back and it is zero that then it indicates that there is some data to be exchanged so if uh, this is zero then you can exchange the data means it implies that there is data present then you can exchange the data or else you can then uh, perform your operation so this is how it goes around so here it specifies sos and us that is start of conversion and end of conversion that is whenever analog signal is received it will start the conversion so that signal will be indicated over here and when conversion is over it will make this this one low so when this is low it gets gives an information telling that i have a signal and uh, conversion is done so you can get access to this data so that is how it goes around the flow chart is associated over here so what happens you start off initially you set uh, the uh, external flag equal to 1 so that is external flag is set to external flag is set to 1 so this goes start of conversion so this any analog signal when it is present it has to start the conversion so that is what it has to do so it will wait for some time and then it will make it as zero so here what happens so since you have set the set the external flag adc will be starting off so when adc starts off what this processor looks is processor looks for this data that is whether the conversion is over or not 
whether the conversion is over or not. So here, what it is che checking whether branch control output is zero or not. So since it is active low, if it is zero, it implies that conversion is over. If it is one, it implies that conversion is not over. So if conversion is not over, you keep on checking that branch control. This thing, since you have started the ADC and you are waiting for the signal to be converted. So once it becomes zero, ADC conversion is done. So that is, this turns out to be zero branch control uh, output. Then you move ahead, read whatever information is there on that ADC, store that information. If you want to process, you can process that information. And again, you can do any other operation which is required with that information. So once that is being done, again, you wait for some amount of time, which is specified by a sampling uh, interval. And again, you go back and see whether any other information is present or not. So you're continuously polling this A to D converter. So that is what is happening in this case. So this is what is happening with respect to what? Parallel IO. Now coming down to the interrupts and the IO. So in uh, processors, we see that uh, regularly we uh, come across with this interrupts. So interrupts can be either internal or it can be external. So whenever interrupt is arising, if interrupt arise, what happens is you have to go and execute one uh, specific uh, routine which is related to that interrupt, which is called as service routine, which is termed as service routine. So this routine will be executed based on the conditions, whether those conditions are satisfied. Directly, it will not be executing that. Again, in interrupts, you have something called as maskable interrupts, un unmaskable interrupts, non-maskable interrupts. So, so many things are there. Along with that, some other conditions also should be satisfying. So that is uh, what it looks out for. Uh, so here, uh, again, uh, if I speak, you have two types that is external or internal. External is related to the hardware interrupts which are present and internal is related to the software interrupts. So when you're writing your program, right, you might uh, have, you, you have come across some instructions like, uh, uh, say, for example, INTR, uh, we have INTR 0, 1, so so on, uh, in, in, interrupt, uh, uh, say, uh, of course, are present. So if, when in software you write it, so this gives us to the internal interrupts of the software interrupts. If uh, a pin on the processor, say for, for example, in this processor, you have a pin which is associated with some interrupt. So it is associated with uh, some uh, interrupt over here. So when this interrupt arises, this, uh, uh, this processor will be processing that information. So if you have uh, hardware, uh, this thing, uh, that is external uh, pin is getting activated related to that interrupt, we call it as uh, hardware interrupt, okay? So that is uh, where you have these concepts, software interrupt and uh, you have hardware interrupts. So here I'm not able to find it, okay? So whenever you have uh, interrupts, right, you can have some lookup table uh, which keeps track of uh, what has to be executed. Uh, for example, in 885, you have uh, memory allocated to each of the interrupts. So whenever, say for example, if you have something as RST zero, RST zero is activated. That is the statement has been executed or RST zero is activated. Then in that case, what happens is, this goes and accesses the interrupt, this thing what has to be executed. So in this part, what will be there? There will be some address associated with the interrupt service. IS interrupt service will be present over there. So it will go and access that interrupt service via accessing this part. So this is how it goes around. So that is interrupt vector table. So that table will be containing that information. Table is nothing but again, uh, such kind of uh, specifications which can be put forth. In 885, this is how it is. In this one, you can have a table. So whenever interrupt comes in, you check which interrupt it is, whether it is maskable, unmask non-maskable or anything, then go and see whether the conditions are being satisfied. If they are satisfied, then go ahead with the servicing of the interrupt. 
so this is uh, how uh, interrupt and ios will be utilized so how do we uh, go ahead with the handling of the interrupt so before going ahead with this again we have something called as interrupt flag registered then masked and unmasked status so few of the interrupts can be masked and few of them cannot be masked that is unmasked so then again we have uh, interrupt mark registers and uh, other is uh, interrupt in bit which actually is related to uh, enable information which is related to the enable information for that interrupt so here uh, so what is uh, done is if you have a interrupt request received if the processor receives the interrupt request we check whether it is a maskable interrupt now if it is a non maskable interrupt or unmaskable interrupt then what we have to do is we have to provide service to that interrupt so interrupt service has to be done so what happens if this interrupt is non maskable that is a kind of i cannot override it when it has come so it is something critical i have to perform so if that is a the case then what i do is i go and provide the acknowledgement to the interrupt then i check whether it is a hardware interrupt or a instruction which has raised this inter interrupt intr is a instruction so if the, if the interrupt is due to this intr instruction if it is uh, not due to this or if it is uh, due to this then what i have to do is i have to set this interrupt mask i have to set this interrupt mask bit to 1 so uh, when it is uh, uh, when it is 1 right i cannot uh, read any maskable interrupts i cannot read any maskable uh, sorry when it is 1 right i can uh, i cannot read any maskable interrupts so that is what it goes around so i am just stopping the other interrupts from being raised over there so now and because i am performing say some critical operation at that moment because i am servicing one of the requests over there so i have to just stop other interrupts from being interrupting this interrupt itself so here what we do is again uh, we set that so based on uh, this case whether it is a hardware interrupt or intr instruction or the interrupt is uh, because of something else then it will be uh, going in a uh, different form so now uh, when interrupt has come in uh, if the the processor is running the running some program uh, running some program then what it has to do is uh, so if there is a program and uh, there is some instruction which is there and program pointer is pointing at this location currently interrupt has been raised so i should store the information related to this instruction i should store the information related to this instruction because i have to service the interrupt and come back and start the execution at this point again so what i do is i go and store the address associated with this part in the stack in the stack that is i store this information so i have to perform that so that is what is specified over here so program counter is saved onto the stack then you service the interrupt and after the service is over you go to stack and get back the program counter information so again it will come back to your program where you had stopped and you continue with the execution so this is when you have unmaskable interrupt now if you have a maskable interrupt you have to go and check whether uh, interrupt mask is zero if it is not zero interrupt mask is not zero then again i have to go and process i have to go and because it has interrupted i'll be disturbed so again i have to go and execute the main program no need to service it so when uh, i and uh, interrupt mask is uh, disabled right so no need to process this interrupt especially for maskable interrupts especially for maskable unmaskable i have no option unmaskable i'll be overriding this part directly will whether it is 1 or 0 you are not bothering but when you process when you are doing this operation right you are taking care that interrupt mask is set to 1 so any other this thing you can go and service so now uh, here if intm uh, interrupt mask is equal to 1 means if it is 0 if it is 1 you have uh, there is no need to go and service it if it is 0 uh, right then you go ahead and see what is there in interrupt mask register if this interrupt mask register bit is set then no need to service this uh, interrupt you can run your program as it is but if this is set to 1 but if this is set to 1 then you have to 
acknowledge that interrupt and see whether it is a hardware or a software interrupt. Based on that, again, you set IMT and uh, that is interrupt mask to one. So interrupt mask to one, it implies what? That no need, if any interrupt comes in, no need to service that. If any interrupt comes in, no need to service that. So till you finish again, you can go back. So uh, if it is not related to this one, then uh, directly you can come to the, uh, the storing of the PC to the stack, then execute the service routine related to that interrupt, then return to your main program by accessing the program counters previous information, and then you continue. So this is uh, the flowchart related to interrupt handling. So whenever interrupt comes in, so how the pro how it is handled. So I'll not be going in detail of this. So this I'll uh, leave as an exercise. So I'll come to direct uh, this one, the in direct memory access. Uh, so here, uh, what happens is sometimes uh, you can go and access the memory directly without the intervention of the CPU. So that is CPU is not part of in accessing the memory because if you have seen, right, you have to perform some operation on the address. So you can uh, take the help of the CPU. But in some cases, I can have some external facilities for that wherein I'll be directly accessing the memory. So wherein CPU intervention, intervention is not there. So such kind of uh, data transfer uh, which is happening without the inter intervention of the CPU, then I call it as a direct memory access. So for this purpose, I should have a DMA controller in order to perform this direct memory access. So in uh, so this is one of the aspects related to DMA. So here uh, for your TMS series, right, you have actually six independent programmable DMA channels. Now these channels are actually associated with priority. You can associate some priority to them. And uh, at any given time, only one channel will be active. There will be more, no, not more, more than one channel which will be active for any of the DMAs. So there are six DMAs, right? Only one channel will be active at any given time. And apart from that, if some priorities are set, some priorities are set. So highest priority DMA will be given its fair chance. Lowest will be given, uh, that is uh, the lowest priority will be executed last. If you have uh, two, uh, two channels which uh, want to contend for DMA, then uh, what happens is uh, the channel, uh, DMA channel with the higher priority will be given first chance and the lower priority will be given the next chances. Now, there is another chance that when you set the priority, two uh, DMA channels might be given same priority levels. So if that is the case, then what happens is each of the DMA channels will be circularly given a chance it will be circularly given a chance. So these are different possible possibilities in a DMA. That is what they have put forth here. Okay. So this is uh, all for uh, today. Uh, so let us meet in the uh, next this thing. So 